I decided to be the main character of today by doing a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum using only canon Pokemon. If this doesn't work, I'll just post something controversial on Twitter. You might be wondering, which Pokemon would be canon? Well, since I'm choosing the male character from Platinum, I'm going to use all of his counterparts in the main games, spin-offs, and manga. In BDSP especially, he's got a lot of options to choose from. But, since this is a canon run, I won't be using any of his team from after defeating the Elite Four ten times. No one has bothered beating the Elite Four ten times, so those teams aren't canon. There are only 15 canon Pokemon remaining now, and this is a Nuzlocke, so if any of them faint, they're considered dead. The full list of the rules are listed here and in the description to the side. <laughs> I begin my journey with True the Turtwig as my starter. In the Pokemon Adventures manga, Diamond, yes that's his name, chose Turtwig, so I will too. Infernape and Empoleon fit the other two better anyways. True will always have a relaxed nature since they clarify that in the manga, and the other Pokemon from the manga team will have set natures as well. Just like any other main character, True and I get an easy victory against our rival. Nice! Once we get our first encounter, we find Tuto the Bidoof. In canon, they're never seen after the capturing tutorial, but we're gonna take this little guy and- Oh, whoa! <laughs> Calm down there, Tuto! Well, he was a little reluctant, but True hung in there long enough for me to make the capture. We talk to a few mysterious clowns in the big city and head to Route 203 for another quick fight against Barry. The first battle must have struck some deep-rooted fear in him, because his Starly and Chimchar only use Growl and Leer. They do not attack once. With this route open, we're free to get a third teammate. But before we do, I head to Orberg City for a free Dusk Ball. The Route 203 Pokemon is Abra. Don and Lucas always have a Kadabra when helping in double battles in these games, and Abra is really good when it evolves. The problem is that it'll teleport away at its first possible chance, and we won't get another shot until way later in the game. So, after waiting until night, the Dusk Ball catches Bruh the Abra before he even realizes. Our ragtag team is leveled and ready, so it's off to fight Rourke for our first badge. I'm not scared though. True has a great matchup for this fight and one-shots the Geodude and Onyx, but not before getting our defenses lowered by Screech. When Kratios comes in, he does over half with Headbutt, while True barely misses out on the kill with Razor Leaf. I switch Tudo into the fight, but Rourke takes that time to heal up his crime against God. Whoops, I forgot gym leaders could heal in this game. But that's okay, because Tudo knows Rock Smash and... I pressed A2 quickly. <laughs> Headbutt does exactly half of our health, and none of Cranios' moves have a chance of missing. Not to mention True can't take multiple hits. I have no choice here but to tell Tudo to charge in full force. They fire off a Headbutt, and... Tudo lives! This time we correctly go for Rock Smash, and... It barely doesn't kill. I'm sorry, Tudo. You had the heart of a fighter from the moment we met, and I let you down. With True free to come in, he avoids the headbutt flinch and gets us our first gym badge. I have very few encounters in this run, so I'm tempted to restart right here, but if I did that, then Tudo truly would have died for nothing. With a new level cap and a buddy of mine with his equally real copy of Platinum, Bra can evolve not once, but twice! Seeing True and Tudo fight in the gym while he was on the sidelines really lit a fire in Bra's heart. He's stepping up his game, so even I can afford a few mistakes. Bra and his newfound power leads the way to Floroma Town, plowing through Team Galactic run after Team Galactic run. A stunky makes me a little nervous, but now we have access to Honey and can get our next two encounters. First is Lax, the impish Munchlax. In the manga, Lax was like Ash's Pikachu. He never evolves and he'll mostly be our team's mascot. Next is Erm the Burmy. In BDSP, whenever you battle Lucas after becoming champion, no more than 10 times, he always has a Motham. Not sure why, but I guess he's a big fan. After True and Erm evolve, we head over to Valley Wind Works to save a little girl's dad. If I'm not the main character, who else could possibly be? Bra once again leads the way, one-shotting Mars' Zubat. Her Perugly is next and True switches in on a fake out. Then while they use Feint Attack and Scratch, True could set up a couple curses. From there, two Razor Leaves claim victory. Wow. I sure have come a long way from a few minutes ago, huh? No deaths! After getting through Eterna Forest, it isn't long before we meet another team member. Left the Cleffa. Just like with Bruh, Don and Lucas always had a Clefairy for those double battles. But Lef won't be quite as present for this run. Spoilers. <laughs> it's a quick jog to the Eterna Gym, and this is where Erm thrives. He's an apex predator from the perspective of these grass Pokemon, 
Gardena can't threaten Urm with anything, so he just sweeps the whole gym. This is the only bit of R&R we get, however, because right away we need to prepare for Jupiter and her Skuntank. This Pokemon is crazy at this point in the game, and my team has a pretty bad matchup for the fight. Night Slash and Poison Gas can just sweep through my whole team if I'm not careful. But then, I had an epiphany. In the manga, Diamond actually caught a Rotom. This is great! Now that I have cut, I can head over to the old chateau and get Tom. Oh, wait a minute. In, in Gen 4, Rotom's other forms don't change types. They're all still just electric ghost. Well, even though Tom will always be weak to Night Slash, the added bulk will at least be something. I'm just gonna change Tom into the microwave form and use overheat for big damage. After picking up the secret key from GameStop, I head to Rotom's room. Oh, my secret key doesn't work until after I beat Jupiter. <sighs> Did not know that. After a good amount of planning, I realized I only had one hope for victory, and Bruh is the front runner. While on my venture for Tom, I pick up the TM for substitute. Bruh's gonna use this to set up and hopefully get us a sweep. The first part of the fight isn't that scary. Jupiter always leads with Zubat. Immediately, we set up a substitute that they break with Bite, and now that they've used Bite, Bruh can disable it and take out the Zubat with his substitute still up. While we're doing all this, Bruh heals a little bit each turn with the leftovers Lax was holding when we caught him. The Skunk of the Hour shows up, so we use Miracle Eye, a move that specifically lets Dark type Pokemon get hit with any type of move. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what type of move they're referring to. While we set up, Skunk Tape deletes our sub with Night Slash. Now Bruh could disable the Night Slash and get rid of any X Factors. From there, a single side beam one shots the Skunk Tank and we. Oh, free, a po free some Pokemon! Yeah, that's why I'm here. Even without trying, the main character once again frees another group of hostages. After making Tom eat a microwave, I head to the underground and spend 40 minutes looking for an armor fossil. Mind you, I'm already accelerating my DS while searching. This was 40 accelerated minutes. But it's time well spent because now I can revive Dawn, the careful shield on from the grave. Yeah, I said Rourke had a crime against God, but Don gets a pass because he's so cute. Look at, uh, look, look at this little guy. I also pick up Gallant the Ralts on the way to Heart Home City. Apparently Gallade is on the same level as Motham, according to Lucas from the games. I, I don't see it, but okay. That's not all because I could then pick up Flare the Eevee from Heart Home City. In Pokemon Masters EX, Lucas gets a Flareon for some reason. Not sure why, but that means we've got one too. The 40 minutes underground weren't fun, but I did at least get a Firestone in that time. Unfortunately, Flare was already level 20 when we got him. I don't know why they did that. Because even though I evolve him right away, he can't learn any fire moves until level 36. And Bite isn't available until level 29 after the level cap, so he's not helping with the Ghost Gym. It would have been nice, because I don't really have any answers for him. I don't feel great about it, but I charge into the fight with Tom while Fantina leads with Duskull. They hit Tom with a couple Shadow Sneaks while we set up Double Team and Confuse Ray. Yeah, we don't even have Ominous Wind yet, so I, I don't have many options here, okay? <laughs> okay, well Shockwave is pretty strong, I guess, so a couple of them take out Duskull anyway. Immediately, Miss Magius comes out. I was gonna use True for this matchup, but I realized Lax is very bulky and does really well here. He eats an immune Shadow Ball on the switch and powers through a Confuse Ray to lick and paralyze Miss Magius turn 1. They hit us with some weak side beams and magical leaves, and eventually I realized it's safer to send in True after all. Once he's in the fight, he's safe to bite through Miss Magius and then the Haunter. And that's badge number 3. I definitely was overthinking that fight. <laughs> There's another fight with Barry right after this, but his team is no match for Tom and Bra. His Monferno is becoming a little scary. But this fight is mainly just a reminder that various Pokemon are going to be bigger threats later on. I forgot to hit record, but on Route 215, I catch Kit, the bold Lickitung. Apparently, Diamond has a lot of round Pokemon in the manga because he really likes eating. Kit is probably the breadwinner in that regard. Maylene is up for gym badge number four, and surprise, surprise, this fight is incredibly easy after True fully evolves. She tries to distract me before the fight starts, but... I'm not that kind of main character, okay? Earthquake one-shots her Metatite and Lucario, then Macho goes down to two Earthquakes right after. Keeping up the good momentum, Dawn and Kid evolve, and I catch Gel the Tangela from the Great Marsh. Tangrowth is one of three Pokemon that Lucas rotates based on his starter in the post-game battles. He never has it on his team while having Torterra, and that's gonna be mostly true for this run as well. Oh wait, hold on! 
Around this corner, I could pick up the Dawnstone and evolve Gallant into Gallade. I didn't remember it being this early, but Gallade is real fun to use. Immediately, we have access to Psycho Cut, Night Slash, and Leaf Blade. Let's go! The battle starts with Kit versus Gyarados. And with the help of Thunderbolt, that we got thanks to some gambling, the Gyarados goes down in one hit. The Futsal is next, but Kit holds on just enough to take it down in two hits. Finally, Quagsire is last, and... Oh, decisions, decisions. I let Gel come in and get the kill, because unless something horrible happens to True, he won't be getting much screen time in this run. He makes me a little nervous after getting confused by Water Pulse and then hurting himself in confusion, but a one-shot with Mega Drain more than makes up for it. Alright, our team is really coming together! What? A terrorist attack in my Pokemon game? I don't think so! I chase this grunt down until we're both out of breath, and once I do finally catch up to him, Gallant takes the field and one-shots his Krogunk with Psycho Cut. Alright, you start ta- Oh, 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 okay. Uh, I guess I'm just gonna let him get away. Oh, from the same direction? Uh, hey, hey, Cynthia, long time no see. <gasps> Barry! Oh, okay, the, the guy went there- uh Oh, what do you- what do you mean the explosion was no big deal? Well, since I'm here, Cynthia wants me to go on an errand for her and cure some wild Psyduck. Sure, I am a hero after all, and little side quests really make the journey- Okay, she came here anyways. Well, since I'm here, Cynthia wants me to go on an errand for her and deliver an old charm to her grandma. Sh sure, I am a hero after all, etc, etc. Ah, this is nice. Cynthia is really missing out on some quality time with her grandma. Oh, hello, who are you? Wait, huh? Did Cynthia set me up to get mugged? Well, Cyrus's Sneasel is some match for Dawn, it so is his Golbat, but Dawn claims victory on them in the end. I didn't have the patience for Dawn to deal with the Murkrow, so Kit comes in to clean up. Oh, uh, sh she came here anyways. Well, since I'm here, Cynthia wants me to head to the library and learn a little something about our history. But I'm not falling for it this time. I'm headed over to Clan Olive City for the gym and the gym only. But before that, it's time to visit the Fuego Ironworks. Here's where I could capture Marg the Magmar. Just like Gel, Magmortar is rotated on Lucas's team depending on his starter. With some incredible luck, I learned not only that Marg has a modest nature, but she also is holding a Magmarizer. A 4% chance for Magmortar's best nature, and a 5% chance to hold the evolution item makes Marg a 1 in 500 Pokemon. There's a lot of Pokemon in the world, but trust me, this is good. Before I realized that, however, I went on to fight Barry for the fifth time. And here's where his Pokemon begin to be fully evolved. As usual, he leads with Staraptor, so I lead with Tom. Tom actually walls Staraptor almost every time thanks to his electric ghost typing. Futsal pursuits Tom while I switch into Kit, who could get the kill with a Thunderbolt and return. Heracross is third, but they're not blessed with the coverage that they'll have later on. So, Erm can come in on a 4 times resistant Brick Break, barely survive an Aerial Ace, and do about 75% with Gust. I would have liked to have a stronger flying type move on my flying type, but this is as good as it gets for the 4th gen Motham. However, the Herculean Heracross's horn is not mega yet, so Bra can switch in and take the kill with Psychic. Barry's Infernape comes out and somehow outspeeds Bra, almost taking him out with a Flame Wheel. Apparently, Bra has minus speed nature, Otherwise, we would have always outsped them. On the flame wheel, I set up Reflex so I could pivot if I really had to, but they just break it next turn with Brick Break. It's a good thing Bra just one-shots them with Psychic anyways. Uh, definitely not overthinking this, guys. Come on. Roserade is last, so I could finally send in Flare to take the win with her new Fire-type move. What a concept. After evolving Marg, I carefully avoid the library and head straight to the Cantilever Gym. Not surprisingly, Byron is a walk in the park. His Magneton gets obliterated by True's Earthquake, and both Steelix and Bastiodon are one-shot by Marg. She has a crazy run up through the gym, and I'm already respecting Magmortar way more than I ever have. It's a quick, begrudging, and required trip to the library right after. And no, it's not because Cynthia recommended it to me. I'm already way too smart as it is anyways. Uh, but apparently there's another terrorist attack in my Pokemon game. If only there was some way we could have gotten this information sooner. My first altercation with Saturn isn't that big of a deal. His only real threat is Toxicroak, but after a bold Thunder Wave, True doesn't have to worry about Poison Jab. One quick Earthquake is more than enough to secure the win at Lake Valor. It's a surprisingly similar story for the next Mars fight. 
But I mean, who couldn't have guessed that? <laughs> I'm pretty much the One Punch Man of Pokemon. The Freerin of Monster Catchers. The Goku of children's games. I guess it's time to check on Barry and see if he needs any help as well. But, ah, uh, he could wait. With the water section of Mount Coronet available, it's time for our penultimate encounter. Milotic, just like Jell and Marg before her, is rotated on Lucas's post-game team, based on the starter. With this encounter, I'll have all of his canon main game team members. There is a catch, however, with Feebas. If you don't already know, Feebas is an incredibly difficult and annoying encounter in the older Pokemon games. This body of water is the only place where you could acquire Feebas in the Sinnoh region. It's made up of 528 tiles of water, and of that 528, only four specific tiles have that Feebas encounter in them. Not only that, but even though Feebas has such a specific encounter location, it still only has a 50% chance of spawning. So, you can't just fish and move on. You could be losing a coin flip. And if all that wasn't bad enough, the four tiles get randomized. Daily. Not to mention the fact that Feebas needs a specific nature to enjoy enough of the right poffins to raise its beauty enough to actually evolve. Listen guys, I'm an adult. I have things that I need to do. Would any of you really be that upset with me if I just caught a Magikarp and altered its DNA to be the prettiest Feebas around? I hope not, but if you are, let me know in the comments. Not long after, I get my final encounter of the run. Moo the Hardy Swinub. Apparently Moo wasn't caught by Diamond, but gifted to him by Platinum, cause Moo reminded her of Diamond. Uh, we count those. <laughs> Finally I made it to Acuity Lakefront. In the time it took me to get here, Barry got a license to use Rock Climb. Well, if he got it that quickly, then surely it'll be no issue for me. I'd like to quickly mention that, in the manga, Diamond actually did catch Reggie Gigas. I would get my uncle to help me here and get the encounter now, but honestly, it's not really worth the effort. I challenge, uh, what, what's her name? To a gym match. She leads with Sneasel, and I lead with Mill for her debut battle. This is a little unfortunate though, because I thought the gym leader was going to lead with Pillow Swine. It's not the end of the world, but this actually does shift the momentum for the entire fight. Gallant was my preferred matchup for the Sneasel, but I just stay in to surf with Mill. After a single exchange of attacks, I go to heal Mill with a recovery, while Obama Snow switches in. This Obama Snow has Wood Hammer, Focus Blast, Avalanche, and Water Pulse. This type coverage is scary, but knowing that they're going for Wood Hammer, I send in Flare. After some chip damage from the hail brings us just over half health, I'm not too sure about living a Water Pulse. So Tom comes in and they end up using Wood Hammer again anyways. Oops. Well, Overheat can miss, and Tom is dead to another Wood Hammer. I could risk the miss on Overheat, but Tom is way too important to make that risk. Taking Wood Hammer number 3 is Marg. It's a heavy blow, but we're safe to outspeed and one shot with Flamethrower. Now that Piloswine is finally in, I stick to my original plan and let Mill take them out. And Sneasel too while she's at it. Finally, what's her name's Frostlass is out. They spend no time wasted and immediately set up two double teams. This stacking with Frostlass Snow Cloak ability, which raises evasion even more in the tail, is really annoying to work with. I do have an answer for this though. Marg re-enters the fight on a third double team. When they set up a fourth, Marg does about 40% with the unavoidable feint attack. This isn't great because they have a Citrus Berry on hand, and one Shadow Ball comboing with Hail Chip guarantees that Marg has to switch out. This is why I switched in Tom before Marg earlier. If she was healthier, Marg would have been fine here. Mill comes in to hopefully tank the attacks long enough to land a hit. But even with Recover, she can't stay in for long, as the second Shadow Ball gets a special defense drop. Moo is the pivot and gets his own crit and special defense drop. Well, it's back to Mill and I'm running out of options. Mill has really good special defense for this fight, but the hail is just so persistent. Turn after turn, Mill goes back and forth between Surf and Recover, and not a single attack of ours lands. But even that's not enough. Another double team. Eventually, Mill is unable to stall any longer as recovers are running dry and Frostlass gets another special defense drop. It's at this point that I realize one of my many friends that have helped me get to this point must sacrifice themselves to let Gallant switch in and then hopefully land a Night Slash. It's tough being the main character. You're on top of the world with no major obstacles, and then all of a sudden you have to dig another grave. 
the answer here is clear, unfortunately, and this time the grave is going to be flare shaped. He was always ready and willing to help out the team, but never really got his time to shine. Flair was actually bulky enough to get an attack off, but is cheated by the enemy's incredible evasion, and then killed with a crit. We're not home free yet. Gallant can take a couple hits here, but if he can't dish it out, then the rest of the team will likely get outsped and just lose. Frostlast lands a 100% accurate blizzard that does almost half. Gallant goes for his first night slash and misses. They follow up by landing a Psychic, but our Citrus Berry brings us back to half. They must have run out of Shadow Balls and Blizzard from all of our stalling earlier. Then, Gallant's second Night Slash misses. It comes down to this. Gallant can only take one more hit before going down. Frostlass attacks one more time with Psychic, leaving our sword-armed hero with a quarter of his health. He unleashes Night Slash number three, and through the Hailstorm, Frostlass takes the hit and goes down. Flare is no longer with us, but with any worse luck, everyone else would have been joining him. I stand by that if this gym leader actually led with Pillow Swine, my rotations would have been on top of everything. Well, GG's team. Good job, Gallant. And rest in peace, Flare. Oh, are you finished already? Your Pokemon aren't bad, but you're laughably weak. You, you know what? I'm, I'm with you, Barry. A quick detour leads me to the Team Galactic Headquarters, who I'm somewhat convinced are working with Cynthia. Round 2 against Cyrus gets a little close, but it's Round 2 against Saturn that catches me off guard. His Golbat and Bronzor go down just as easy as any other, but Toxicroak starts doing some consistent damage to the team. Mill switches in on a Poison Jab, and she would have been fine if it didn't poison. Tom switches in to also get poisoned. After barely living a fan attack and eating their berry, they then land a Thunder Wave. This lets me send in Moo, who can now outspeed and take the kill with Earthquake. One double battle with Barry later, and Cyrus starts achieving his dream, but quickly gets abducted. No? What's wrong, Cynthia? Are you worried about Cyrus? Oh, no, it's fine. I'll go after him and put a stop to him. Oh, you're gonna go too? Oh, okay, that'll be a first. After some time navigating the distortion world, dubbed by Cynthia, by the way, I challenge Cyrus to our third and final fight. Cyrus sends his Houndoom to burn Dawn, and Dawn sets up Stealth Rocks. All of Cyrus's Pokemon are weak to these things. They begin to damage us, so Gallant switches in. Unfortunately, he gets burned right away, but one Drain Punch is still enough to get the kill. Do these odds seem kind of crazy to anyone else? Dawn pivots in to eat Honchkrow's Drill Peck, and then I send in Marg on a Heat Wave. Surprisingly, Marg outspeeds and then gets the kill with Thunderbolt. Now Gyarados is here, so I can switch in Tom on an immune Earthquake. Having Tom's immunities are really nice this late in the game. We outspeed and get another kill with Thunderbolt. Weavile is next, and not only does it have great coverage, but it also outspeeds my entire team. My bulkiest bet is Mill, who switches in to a tough Night Slash. From here, she can then protect to get a little leftovers recovery, and go for recover the next turn. That is, if the Night Slash didn't crit. And that makes Mill our third friend to go down. Dawn would have been okay here, but was way too weak to tank any hits from the Weavile. We really needed to dodge the Night Slash crit. But sadly, these are the cards that were dealt. Ah man, after all of that grinding for Mill too. Moo is now safe to come in, and Ice Punch gets another crit, putting him in the yellow. But Earthquake can now take down the Weavile, and... Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> fine. Well, Ice Shard is resisted, so that won't work. It looks like we'll just have to dodge another crit. Whew, good job, Moo. That was a close one. Cyrus's last Pokemon, Crobat, comes out, but is no match for Tom. And that's it for Cyrus. You know, Cynthia, Mill wouldn't have died if you just joined the fight at any point, you know? Oh, you're healing me! Cool, thank you! I just throw a Master Ball at Giratina, let's just get out of here. It's now my job to motivate someone else to do their job. But at this point, I just want to get to Elite Four. It's not like Cynthia was doing her job or anything. I just want to show her how it's done. But first, of course, I need to fight Volkner. His team isn't that scary. Every one of them falls to, you guessed it, Earthquake. 
After juggling six required eight gems through Victory Road, I have one last wall standing in my way. Barry took Jupiter's words to heart earlier, because now his team is well balanced and has good movesets. Not only do I have to bring Bra and Gel back from vacation early, but also Tom changes his form for the first time in forever. Our final fight against Barry kicks off, and it's Staraptor versus Tom. Even in Frost form, Tom is an electric ghost type. They're still immune or resist all of their moves, and a faster Thunderbolt gets a clean kill. Barry's Floatzel comes in, and the crunch is not enough to stop Tom from getting a second Thunderbolt kill. Roserade poses some threat now, so I switch Kit in, who just goes to sleep right away with Grass Whistle. She's pretty bulky, so after a few turns, she wakes up and freezes the Roserade with Ice Beam. So that's what it feels like. For some reason, Barry wants to preserve Roserade, so Infernape switches in. And this thing is scary. It took me some time to figure out how to deal with it, with its speed and crazy coverage of Focus Blast, Shadow Claw, Flamethrower, and Aerial Ace. My goal was to pivot so that Bra could come in on this thing, but since they are for sure already going for Focus Blast, now's the time. It's even better when they miss. Thanks to the higher level cap, Bra can now outspeed and one-shot Infernape, Heracross, and Roserade. Heracross in particular was going to be a huge issue, so I don't know why he did that, but that was really lucky. Snorlax is last, so Gel could come in and set up Stun Spore, and then do some pretty nice damage. We still don't have a guaranteed kill in our moveset, so True comes in to get us the win. GG's Barry- oh, okay, bye. It took a little bit, but I think I'm beginning to feel pretty confident in myself and my team again. It's time I take these guys all the way through the Elite Four, and then take the title of champion away from Cynthia. The team I'll be bringing is True, Bruh, Tom, Gallant, Moo, and Marg. For the most part, our canonical team has remained intact. With these boys and girl and they them, I'm feeling very confident. This confidence was well founded, because Marg just sweeps through all of Eren's Pokemon with Flamethrower. Aside from Drapion, who Moo handles with ease. The Rampage doesn't stop there, because Brock can do the same thing to Bertha's team with the help of Choice Specs. Grass Knot takes out Whiskash, Hippowdon, and Rhyperior. I'm not too confident Gliscor will go down that easily, so Tom tags in to take it out with Blizzard. Golem is last, but she can only hit Tom with Fire Punch or Thunder Punch. They never Earthquake thanks to Levitate, and their fourth move is Sandstorm. That means Brock can safely come in and get us another easy win. Flint is where things get a little less easy. Just like my rival, he also has Infernape, but this one is not as easy to switch into. Just like before, Bro is my only Pokemon that has a chance to outspeed. For me to get out of this fight, he's my win condition. Flint's lead is Houndoom, but it isn't much of an issue. He just gets one shot by Drain Punch from Gallant. Rapidash is next, and this is exactly what we want. He could set up with Sunny Day, or even just hit hard with Flare Blitz, but since Galite is a fighting type, I'm betting on them using Bounce. That would give Bruh a safe turn to switch in, then we just have to dodge a Paralysis from Bounce. Then we would be free to get some Okos from there. But when I send Bruh into the fight, the unthinkable happens. They set up Solar Beam. Now instead of waiting for them to hit us with Bounce, Bruh can just outspeed and get the kill on Rapidash and Infernape. A Ghost from Christmas Past puts a hold on the sweep though, Flareon is too bulky to go down to even a choice spec Psychic, and Bro will for sure die to Giga Impact. Mark switches in to take a hit, and... He went for Will-O-Wisp? Alright, way to throw Flynn! From here, Mark dodges a crit and does some damage with Thunderbolt, then Tom can switch in on an immune Giga Impact and freely take out Flareon. Magmortar is last, and still pretty scary. They exchange some hits, and Gallant switches in to a Flamethrower, that burns. Alright, fair enough. For some reason they go for Solar Beam again, and that gives Gallant a chance to use Psycho Cut. It doesn't crit, and their Citrus Berry brings them back to half health. I, I don't have many options for this thing, so Gallant stays in to eat the Solar Beam. He's left in the red and unleashes close combat on the Magmortar, barely taking it out, marking the end of the third Elite Four fight. I'm glad my team and I got out of that in one piece, and I think we would have been fine without Flint throwing, but we take those. Finally, it's time to deal with Lucian. His psychic type team can be pretty scary if you're not ready for it, but Bra has been here to help every step of the way, and this time is no different. 
Before I had held off on giving Bra the Shadow Ball TM, because I didn't know if he'd make it this far. But thankfully he did, so a Choice Specs boost is actually just enough for him to sweep most of Lucia's team. Even after a crit! We're not safe to one-shot Gallade, but there's nothing to worry about here. True finally enters the Elite Four run to deal with him. Then when Lucian's own Alakazam comes out, Gallant gets a clean critical hit one-shot. And that's the entirety of the Elite Four down. You know, I may not have gotten a lot of encounters in this run, but the few I did get have been very good. Being the main character really has some perks. Who would have thought? But it looks like I'll have to cut this self-serving monologue short, because Cynthia is waiting, and something tells me that she won't just be giving me the Cyrus treatment. The final battle begins with Spiritomb vs Marg. We waste no time and immediately go to Toxic Stall. There's no fairy type in this game, so a Spiritomb with no weaknesses is scary. Their Dark Pulse does more to Marg than I was hoping, but I can't afford to switch in anyone else. Mark stays in to do a little more damage with Flamethrower, and crits? Alright, that is really good for us. Keeping Mark healthy in this fight is great. It's a slightly different story with Milotic on the field, however. Gallant and his special defenses are best suited for the fight. But I messed something up. For this fight, I was supposed to reteach Gallant the super effective Leaf Blade. But instead, now all we could do is Drain Punch. He's able to come out on top, but ironically, I think Leaf Blade would have left him a little healthier. But there's no time to ponder because Togekiss is here. Its moves are relatively limited in the eyes of Tom, who is at best hit neutrally by Water Pulse. A couple of Thunderbolts take down Togekiss, getting Lucario to enter the field. A Shadow Ball isn't usually scary for True, but it is when it gets a special defense drop. True's been my best buddy from the very beginning, but all I could do here is believe that he can live in Aura Sphere from this health. I hold my breath and... Earthquake gets rid of Lucario. Let's go! But there's still no time to breathe. Cynthia's Garchomp, the run ender of run enders, is here. Dragon Rush, Flamethrower, Earthquake, and Giga Impact are all on the table. And Mu needs to enter this fight safely. At this point on the run, I don't want to switch anyone in. They all put in such great performances throughout the game. But someone is going to have to die here. But I'm not the one to make the decision. Time after time, Gallant has saved the run from devastation, and he doesn't want this time to be any different. He tags out True, who looks back, wishing things could be a little different. Gallant firmly plants his feet in front of the Garchomp, bracing for impact. But the Dragon Rush misses! There's a chance! I almost gave Gallant Ice Punch for this very scenario, but just like Leaf Blade, it didn't make it on the loadout. After locking in Psycho Cut, Gallant once again braces for a deadly Dragon Rush, and they miss again! Unfortunately, it only does a third of health to Garchomp. If we want Gallant to live, not only will he have to dodge a third Dragon Rush, but also land a crit with close combat. And just like that, the hero of this run gets taken out. He fought incredibly hard until the bitter end, even against Cynthia's Garchomp. Your sacrifice will not go to waste, Gallant. Mu comes in, but that doesn't guarantee victory just yet. He could eat one hit and go for the Ice Fang, but Ice Fang does have a chance to miss. Ice Shard's 100% accurate, but it's not as strong. Of course, Garchomp outspeeds and goes for a super effective Flamethrower. But after dodging a burn and a crit, Mu lands the four times effective Ice Fang, taking down the Garchomp once and for all. Cynthia's last Pokemon is Roserade, and since Marg toughed out the Spiritomb fight earlier, she's eager to take the field one last time. On the switch, she takes a resisted energy ball, then heals with Protect and Leftovers. After that, Roserade fires off a strong sludge bomb that poisons Marg, but it's too little too late. Marg shows Cynthia what a real flamethrower looks like, and one-shots the Roserade with a crit, claiming us the victory against the Elite Four champion and the game. It's canon! Thank you all so much for watching. It's been a while since I played Pokemon Platinum, so this wasn't only fun, but it was also a good nostalgia trip. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, then I suggest subscribing as I do have plenty more videos and ideas in the pocket. If you have any other run ideas you'd like to see me try, let me know down below, or, or to the side now.
I may not be able to make these super frequently, but if you're interested for some more content, then you could check out my highlights channel where I'm posting uh, highlights of my Inclement Emerald run, my first time playing Dark Souls 3, and more. Everything you see on the highlights channel, and some runs you'll see on this channel, can be found live on my Twitch. I have a great time over there, and I'd love to see you there too. Anyways, that's all I've got for today, and again, thank you all so much for watching, especially if you made it to the end. I'll see you guys next time, and have a good one.